Welcome to LinuxCon and ContainerCon Europe 2016. Uh, we've got a great crowd today. Look, people are still, come on in everyone. There's some seats over here. Um, what a great crowd we have today. And what a great year. This is the 25th anniversary of Linux. So congr let's give Lin uh, congratulations, 25 years. I'd, uh, I'd like to start out by thanking our sponsors. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, Huawei, our diamond sponsor, uh, our platinum sponsors, Citrix, Fujitsu, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Intel, Oracle, and SUSE, uh, and our gold sponsors, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, IBM, and Red Hat. And, uh, you know, on the 25th anniversary uh, of Linux, I thought it would be interesting to reflect upon just how far Linux has come in 25 years. Uh, Linux is really, if you think about it, the most successful software effort in the history of computing. Uh, and I mean, that really is true. Both relative to open source and proprietary software, there really is nothing that matches Linux. I mean, look, look at these numbers, 53,000 files, 21 million lines of code, thousands of developers creating Linux from all over the world, creating billions of dollars worth of value, and being used in some of the most important sys computing systems in the world, essentially being used in the vast majority of computers that run uh, most of our modern society, whether it's in high-performance computing systems that forecast climate change, weather, uh, or in the vast majority of mobile devices, and consumer electronics, or powering the entire global economy by powering most of the world's uh, equities trading platforms. Uh, Linux is just uh, an incredible success story in the world of software, period. And what I think is amazing about Linux is that over 25 years, what started with a very small group of developers 25 years ago, uh, has grown to a developer velocity that is amazing. Just look at these numbers. 10,000 lines of code are added to, 5,300 5, lines of code are removed, and 1,800 lines of code are modified in Linux every single day. That's just, it, it's insane. Uh, Greg Crow Hartman did a, a look at this, and I think uh, he's around here somewhere. Linux right now is changing seven, eight times an hour every single day, every hour of every single day, 365 days a year. No single organization, no single individual can keep up with that developer pace. It is amazing. So the question that I think we should ask ourselves in 25 years of Linux is, you know, what has Linux really proven? That open source is a better, faster, cheaper way to create software? That having no roadmap works, right? There really is no roadmap for Linux. Uh, that Git's a better tool to build software. I think a lot of people might think that's true. That Linus Torvalds is a great leader. Uh, that the kernel community does everything perfectly. Why does that get a laugh every time? <laughs> they certainly don't. Uh, that developers are the new kings of the technology industry. That microkernels stink. Why isn't it? No one's clapping for that one. Uh, no, I think what, what Linux has proven is a lot of those things. But I think what it's proven uh, is more important, something more important than that. If you really boil down what Linux has done over the last 25 years, what it has truly proven uh, is one simple concept, that you can make yourself better while making others better at the same time. This is the quintessential nature of open source and Linux development. And you can call it conscious capitalism, you can call it the purpose economy, or simply sharing. But it matters. You see, it'll, it, it really, what this does is it allows us to sort of transcend our individual parochial concerns. And, you know, when open source and free software first got started, people thought of this as some kind of hippie movement or fringe movement. But in 25 years, what we have proven in Linux in particular is that this matters, that you can selfishly create businesses around open source software, you can scratch your own itch in those communities, and when you do that, that helps 
others at the same time. And I think over 25 years, if you think of nothing else that matters, that is the most important thing to think about. And I think all of you who do work in open source and work uh, in particular in Linux need to remember just how big of an impact you've had on the world. And I want to show you a short video of a kid whose lives all of you collectively changed and why this kind of sharing truly matters. Let's take a look. We had a family PC since uh, about 2010, and in 2012, I started, I, I heard of uh, Linux, and I started experimenting uh, with it a lot. I think my first uh, distro was Ubuntu 12.04 uh, that I tried out in uh, VirtualBox. I don't know too much programming. I don't even know much programming, but I would still uh, love to learn programming and even get a job. You know, maybe someday I could probably become a sysadmin in Linux. I could uh, help people use Linux. It was a school project, of course. I decided to send a letter to uh, Linus Torvalds. He was my hero, and um, I was actually doubting I would actually be able to find out, you know, who I could send it to. Then I remembered how much I love Linux, and you know, how much I wanted to meet Linus Torvalds. So I decided to send him a letter. You know, all my other friends sent letters to, you know, more Hollywood or internet celebrities, but uh, I doubt they actually got flown to you know, a good place like this to meet them. Meeting Linus Torvalds was a great experience. Once the um, whole panel thing was done, he went out of the stage, um, went to uh, my row, and we shook hands. And he signed my uh, Linux Bible, and he gave me a copy of his uh, Just For Fun book, with a signature, of course. I loved meeting uh, Linus Torvalds, and it was a great experience overall. I got to have got to have so much uh, goodies or swag, and it made me think. You know, all this, all these things. Like, my future is going to be great, and um, you know, I loved it. That's what Linux has done for the world. It changes people's lives, society depends on it. It has really created a new norm for software development. Open source is now the major way that modern technology, modern software gets developed. There is just simply too much software to be written in the world today for any one organization or developer to do it themselves. And open source has even transformed uh, not just the software industry, but open source has become a new economic norm. Not only changing people's lives, but changing the economy of the world. Open innovation, the sharing economy, all of these things are now part and parcel to how the most competitive modern economies and companies and organizations in the world operate. You know, today, most modern code comes from outside of any single organization. I mean, even Apple. If you go, I don't know if anyone here has an iPhone, but if you go into your iPhone, into the general about setting, into the legal notices, you'll see hundreds of open source licenses inside of every iPad, iPhone, Mac, all over the place. Because organizations realize by leveraging this great shared technology investment, they can get to market faster, they can produce better innovation, they can produce software more uh, cost-effectively. And then for that final 20%, that part on top of the 80%, organizations focus on the things that are most important to their customers, to their constituents, and so forth. And that is a tremendous benefit. I would argue that organizations who don't leverage open source will be unable to compete in the modern technology arena. And so, let's just think about where we're at now, after 25 years, and look towards the future. Where is open source going, and how can we all be 
an important part of leading that future. And I think what's interesting to look at is just how many open source projects there are out there today. You know, there are 38 million repositories on GitHub. I had to go double check this statistic, it's, it's amazing. SourceForge is home to 430,000 open source projects. Apache has 175 committees managing 300 projects. There's 50 under incubation. The Eclipse Foundation has 160. OpenStack has 49 teams working on 1,500 projects. And that's just a small part of the open source world. This is an amazing number of projects, millions and millions and lines of code, millions of developers. And so the question is, what open source projects matter? I think that's a question that we should all keep asking ourselves. I mean, if you look at sort of the value of individual projects in terms of their market adoption, in terms of how many people are using it, to just the sheer number of open source projects, you see sort of this long tail effect, right? And there's just certainly a lot of open source projects up there that are up on, out of those 38 million repos on GitHub, there's probably a lot of repos that aren't quite in the big time yet. And so the question is, what really defines a project that matters? that's sustainable, that can change the world the same way that Linux can. I think most developers who are working on open source projects look at Linux and say, we'd love to be like that project. In fact, I think a lot of open source projects explicitly say that. We're the Linux of blank, the Linux of the cloud, the Linux of embedded, the Linux of you name it. And the answer to which projects really matter are projects with sustainable ecosystems. This is an important thing for everyone to understand as we move towards the future of open source. That there's essentially three separate and distinct phases that are symbiotic, that are related to each other in terms of how open source can succeed. It starts with a killer project and great code, a strong and diverse developer community that functions well. Open source projects that function really well create great code, start to become products. And it could be a product in a commercial sense, it could be a product in a government sense, a voter registration system, a land registration, whatever it might be. But somebody is using that code to do something useful. To do something, but what I mean by do something useful, I mean by creating value. Whether it's an embedded device, a online, a uh, website, uh, a automotive system. They're taking those projects, they're pr improving them, they're modifying them, they're testing them in order to create value. And that product phase then leads into the next phase, which is a profit phase. Essentially harvesting value. And it could be, if you're a product company like Red Hat, in net profit. Red Hat is doing extremely well. You look at organizations like SUSE, double-digit year-over-year growth, they're net profiting from using open source in products that they sell to customers. Or it could be in reducing overall cost. If you're Facebook or Amazon, you're using open source software to provide uh, a social networking service, or if you're Google, a search service. The point is, when you take that value, when you have that profit, what we're now seeing in the best open source projects, the ones that are most sustainable, a portion of that profit, a portion of that value, gets reinvested back into the project. And then you know what happens? The same thing over and over again. More products, more use, begets better code, improvement, better testing, better security, more features, additional improvements. That creates more value. That value is then re-harvested and then put back into the project, and so on and so forth. This is an important goal that we should all understand, that we're in a symbiotic relationship between the projects, the products that are outcomes of those projects, the profit that comes from those, and then the re-harvesting back into it. And the reason I believe in this so much is because I've met a few open source projects that broke this feedback loop. OpenSSL is a good example. And what did we get for that? Heartbleed. Nobody was working on the project, no one was investing in that project. Network time. This is the, you know, 
open source project that keeps time on the internet. No one is investing in it. There was no sustainability loop. And you know what happened? It created a global vulnerability from a security perspective on the internet. And that's why we created the core infrastructure initiative at the Linux Foundation, because we recognize the value of being able to sustain these communities. Those are exceptions. The best open source projects all hit this feedback loop. At the Linux Foundation, we want to help enable open source projects to come out of that organic innovation that happens on the very long part of the tail here and move towards sustainable ecosystems. When you look around this week at the different new open source projects that are out there, whether it's around containers, whether it's next week at our embedded Linux conference, you'll see this interesting organic innovation coming from the ground, working its way up, up and to the left in this case, which I love the up and to the left because all investor slides, the goal is up and to the right in terms of profit. And if, once again, the left starts to be the norm in open source. But again, I think if we don't create these sustainable ecosystems, and if companies don't take advantage of this, they'll have a hard time competing. And let me tell you, ecosystems, the project phase of this, which a lot of you are involved in here, take real work. You have to have a good governance system. You have to separate business decisions from technical decisions. All Linux Foundation projects separate the individual developer role from the underwriting and business role within the project. In those projects, the technical decisions get made by the developers and the business decisions to underwrite the infrastructure, the events like this, those are done separately. You need a good development process. In the projects that matter, we see this over and over again. Whether it's a Linux Foundation project, an Apache Software Foundation project, an Eclipse Foundation project, there's a technical decision-making process, there's a project life cycle, there's a release process. I mean, Linux is probably one of the most refined processes in the world, but you need it in that project phase. You need technical infrastructure that's secure, that's in a place that can accelerate the way developers work. You need ecosystems. It turns out marketing matters even in the project phase. You need a way to bring new developers into your community, to reach out to them, to communicate with them, to hold events like this where you can interact face-to-face -face and accelerate the development process. And then the last thing you need is a place to manage the intellectual property assets of an open source project. The trademarks that are used in those projects in a neutral entity, a place where copyright uh, regimes are understood and complied with, and a place where people create a patent no-fly zone so that people can share what they want to share and keep what they want to keep. These are the important things that you need to create these ecosystems. And I think that the open source world is getting good at that, but again, I want to remind everyone how we're in this lot together. It's a symbiotic relationship. Projects depend on becoming used in some form of a product or a service. Value is created and so on and so forth. So if we get really good at that, where can we go from here? Well, the Linux Foundation, which is not the whole open source world, a small part of it, but we started with Linux. And organizations and people and developers came to us and said, you know what, can you take the things you've learned from Linux and apply it up and down the stack? And so you see projects, whether it's things like Node.js, the higher levels, of the stack or at very low levels of the stack in networking and data plane services, things like Open vSwitch, IOVisor, FDIO. At every layer of the stack, you're seeing a major open source project creating new innovation, expanding markets, defining new sectors of technology. You're going to hear from Solomon Hikes in a minute here. I mean, containers are certainly defining how modern uh, cloud applications are being built, redefining how they're being built. So at every layer of the stack, we see a major open source project. So this in and of itself is great, but one of the things that we believe at the Linux Foundation is that we can do even more by focusing up and down the stack. First of all, we think we can help projects create more secure code. 
Security is something that's important to the privacy, the reliability, the online safety of everyone on Earth. And one of the most important parts of security is not remediating a vulnerability after it's happened, not trying to figure out how the bad guys got in. The most important thing that we need to do, because that's kind of open heart surgery, right? The most important thing we need to do is be, like, get a good personal trainer. Write secure code in the first place. This will reduce vulnerabilities. This will create a better, safer, more private world. And so that's why we started the Core Infrastructure Initiative. And we have a program where every one of our projects, and not just Linux Foundation projects, but any project, can go and get a badge indicating that they're doing more and better secure coding, that they are testing their code, fuzzing their code, that they have a responsible disclosure policy, that they uh, are working to threat model their code and so forth. The open source community can collectively create a culture of secure coding and create a better future for all of these projects. We think it's important to create uh, modern governance and ecosystems, which I've already talked about. What we want to do is provide platforms that allow developers to grow their uh, projects and their communities even faster through good legal rules, through proper ecosystem development, and more. Intellectual property sharing is something that we can improve greatly in open source as well. This week, uh, one of our organizations, OpenChain, is meeting. OpenChain is an organization that's working with different uh, companies and individuals to allow license compliance and understanding the intellectual property obligations of all the different copyrights that govern all these open source projects, how to make that compliance easier, faster, more understood. They're working to educate the next five to 10,000 attorneys on what an open source license is, how to comply with them, how to share code more effectively and better. And finally, we think that there's a real uh, value in training practitioners of these open source projects earlier. What we've seen over the years is that as an open source project, I mean, Docker is a great example, it just came out of nowhere and went straight through the ceiling, kind of up into the right. But there aren't enough developers and practitioners of that form of development to take advantage of the code that's growing very, very quickly. We want to close that gap. And so at the Linux Foundation, we're creating training programs and ways to get more practitioners to build these ecosystems more quickly. We think that we can do good up and down the stack and vertically across all these stacks. And if we do that well, what we're going to do over the next 25 years is build the greatest shared technology investment in history. I would encourage you all to keep thinking about that. That's your North Star. That's what you should think about. Every single person in this room is a part of something incredibly important. Your legacy, all of your legacy 25 years from now, will be able to say, I helped create the greatest shared investment in history. Modern computing systems, the way we communicate, artificial intelligence systems, you name it, were built in part from my participation by sharing and helping myself at the same time. And that is a pretty special thing for all of us to be a part of. So I want to congratulate Linux on 25 years, and here's to 25 more. Let's give another hand for Linux.